We're going to start this video off with a puzzle. For those who don't know, this is a numeric eight puzzle. It scrambles the tiles and you have to move everything one tile at a time until you have it back in numerical order. The question for us is if you were to switch these last two tiles, is this still possible to get back to the correctly ordered configuration? Can you logically prove whether it is or isn't? Now we'll get to the question of why would anyone need to know this, but for now just focus on the mathematical reasoning here. People who have just gone through high school math might be looking at this with no clue how to start. You might be waiting for a formula like you're being asked to solve for the volume of something. But that's not the case here. There's no formula, it's just logic and reasoning and it's a different kind of math compared to what we see throughout high school. Again, we're trying to get the tiles in numerical order from left to right and going down, as if we were reading a book. So what we can do is lay the tiles out sideways, with the blank spot being at the end, and just look at them with a different perspective. But we're curious whether this is possible to solve when the last two numbers are switched. Now let's analyze what happens when we move a tile. If we do a sideways move on our game, it switches the location of the number and the blank spot. Notice that the relative order of the numbers does not change though. A sideways move actually preserves the order of the numbers. Then if we do a vertical move and bring the 5 down, it's now ahead of the 6 and the 8. In the linear model, the 5 moves two places backwards, bumping the 6 and 8 forward. In fact, whenever we move a tile up or down, it will move two places forward or backward respectively, and this is the only way to change the relative order of our numbers. Remember this, vertical moves can only move a piece two places forward or backward. Now let's go back to our initial setup real quick with a 7 and 8 out of order and look at how many pairs of numbers are out of order. The 1 and the 2 are in order, because 1 comes before 2 as it should. 1 and 3 are good, even 1 and 8 are good because 1 comes before 8 numerically as it does here. In fact, every pair of numbers is in relative order except 7 and 8. Thus we have one pair out of order. The goal is to have 0. So now let's do another vertical move and move the 6 down. On our linear number line, we know the 6 moves two places to the right. But before I move it, look closely. Originally, the 6 and the 8 are in order, because 6 is supposed to come before 8. Once I move it, they are out of order, and our out of order pairs changes from 1 to 2. But of course, we're moving it two spots. It was in order with the 7, but that changes as well, leaving us with three pairs out of order. So we did a vertical move, the number moved two places backward, which changed our out of order pairs by two, one for each move. In fact, no matter what the order, every time a tile makes a single move along our number line, the out of order pairs will either increase by one or decrease by one. If the two numbers are out of order, after a move they will be in order, thus however many out of order pairs we have will decrease by one. And if they're initially in order, after the move they will be out of order, thus an increase in one. Each single move makes the out-of-order pairs either increase or decrease by one. But remember, when we move vertically, the only way to change the order of everything, tiles move two places over. That's our only option. If each move either increases or decreases the out-of-order pairs by one, then after two moves you can either have a change of two, a change of zero, however it may happen, or a decrease in two. This is all that a vertical move can do. If our puzzle starts with one out of order pair, and these are the only options, no matter how many moves we do, adding to, subtracting to, or staying the same, there is no way to reach zero out of order pairs, which was our goal. Thus, this puzzle is impossible. Hopefully this wasn't too confusing, but I really like this example. This is a famous problem in discrete math and is even taught at MIT in their Mathematics for Computer Science class. I like this example because there's virtually no mathematical background needed, but it did involve mathematical reasoning and I'm sure most people just can't look at it and understand it immediately. Computer scientists and mathematicians have to do proofs like this all the time to understand a system or model from the ground up, and I hope you realize that it's very different than what you see in most high school math classes. This video is really on the mathematics that computer science and math majors see, as well as a few others, but I really wanted the focus to be on computer science because especially if you go into research, this is the kind of math you will need a foundation in. In this video and the next, I will show applications, but the proofs won't be anything that a mathematician would approve of due to time. Now let's go into another proof that's much easier and again needs no real mathematical background, just logical reasoning. Let's say you have an 8x8 checkerboard with the end corners missing. The question is, can you fill up every space with 31 domino pieces? Well, an 8x8 checkerboard has 64 squares. Minus 2 from the ends missing is 62. 
and 31 dominoes that cover two spaces each would cover a total of 62 spaces. But how can we show that it definitely is or is not possible to cover the entire board? See if you can get it, but the answer is fairly simple. Whether you orient the domino vertically or horizontally, it will cover one black space and one red space. Therefore, 31 dominoes would have to cover 31 red spaces and 31 black spaces. If you notice, those missing end pieces are both red, which means there are 32 black squares and 30 red squares. Like we said, we would have to have 31 of each, and since we don't, there is no way to cover the entire checkerboard with these, and our proof is done. These proofs are often the beginning of a discrete math class. You will learn proof techniques like proof by induction or contradiction that I won't go over, so no, it's not just all puzzles like these. While these were more general examples that might not have a direct obvious application, you have to learn these proofs so you can then apply them to the more applicable problems, which I'm gonna go into now starting with graph theory. This is a huge field in math and computer science. In graph theory, graphs are not like x squared or sine of x. Graphs have a bunch of dots or nodes and lines that connect them or edges. The applications for this are endless. Maybe these nodes represent people and the edges are compatibility according to their dating profile. You might need to figure out an algorithm to best match everyone because lots of pairs of people will be compatible on these sites. Nodes could represent computers and the edges are cables that connect them where data needs to travel the shortest path to reach its destination. Or nodes could represent destinations like cities and edges are highways or roads that connect them. Many of these problems are not very easy, but here's a simple question you can use graph theory to solve. In a room of 27 people, can everyone shake hands with nine others? Well, since this is graph theory, we'd have 27 nodes which represent the people. I won't show all 27 dots, but here are some to illustrate the solution. Now, if a pair of people shake hands, we can represent that with an edge. So right now, this person shook one person's hand, and so has this other person. The question is, can everyone shake hands with nine others? To solve this, we only need one piece of background information. Look at this graph I just randomly found and count how many edges or lines leave this dot or node. Of course, there's only one. This is the degree of the node. Now what about node four? Well, we see there are four edges leaving it, which is its degree. If we do this for every node, these are the amount of edges leaving each one or the degrees. Add all these degrees up and we get 10. Now that we have that, count the amount of edges or lines that you see. You'll find there are five, which is half the sum of the degrees. If we look closer, we'll see this is always true. Every edge connects two nodes. So that one edge makes both nodes have a degree of one for a total of two. So we have something very important here. The sum of the degrees, adding every single line that leaves each dot, is always twice the amount of lines or edges that you see. Now we can go back to our problem. If everyone must shake hands with nine others, then every node or dot needs nine lines coming from it, meaning they gave nine handshakes. Therefore, every node would have a degree of nine. If 27 nodes all have a degree of nine, then the sum of those degrees is 243. And we said the sum of the degrees is always twice the amount of edges. That means there are 121.5 edges, which is not possible. The amount of edges or lines has to be an integer like 1, 2, 103, etc. So the answer is no. In a room of 27 people, everyone cannot shake hands with exactly 9 others. If you did not get that, try this next one. If we have a bunch of nodes that represent locations, maybe cities, and edges which represent roads between them. Can you find a path that travels every road exactly one time and ends exactly where you began? So you can pick where you start, and once you use a road, you can never use it again. I'll just tell you the answer is yes. You can go to each city and use every road only once. There is more than one way to trace this path out, but this is one way to go over every edge only once and end up exactly where you started. This type of path is called an Euler tour, where no lines are repeated and you end where you started. Now real quick, this is sort of a side tangent, and I don't know why I remember this, but when I was in high school one day, my friend challenged me in class to draw this shape, but with two conditions. I could not take my pencil off the paper, and I could not go over the same line twice. 
This was just randomly brought up by the way, my friend probably heard it from another friend, but no matter how many times I tried, I could not do it. I was always like one or two lines off, but I could not complete it because it would require me to go over the same line twice. I think I remember this because I tried so many times and it was bugging me. Neither of us knew whether it was impossible or we just couldn't find a way to do it. But years later, while learning graph theory, I read over this one theorem, then almost immediately took out a pencil and paper and drew the shape, which I still had in memory. I took a single look and realized finally, not only is it impossible to do, but I knew exactly why and I want to explain that here. So why can we find a path here that goes to every city once without reusing a road, but we cannot draw this shape without retracing a line? Well, on this graph that we can find a path for, we have to start somewhere. We then have to go to some node via some line or edge. Then we have to leave that node and go to a second via a different line or edge. Every time we take one line to get to a node and another line to leave it. And if we ever return to that same node, it must be via a new line, and we must leave via another new line. Notice all of these come in pairs. So in order for an Euler tor to exist such that we never repeat an edge, every node must have an even degree. For every line that comes into a node, a different one needs to leave. Just like you see here, if you look at the degree for every node, they're all even. Now going back to the drawing, Given the two conditions, if we just represent these points as nodes, we can say that if an Euler tor exists, then it is possible to draw the shape. I mean, just take the last graph. You can think of the red dot as a pencil drawing it out. We know it won't go over any line twice and it never will leave the page. Therefore, you could draw this graph. But in the drawing we have here, the degree of these nodes is five because five edges leave them all. And five is an odd number. So an Euler tor does not exist because all the nodes need an even degree. But we aren't in the clear yet. Neither condition said that we had to end where we started. We can end wherever we want. We just can't go over the same edge twice. Now this is called an Euler walk. It's the same as an Euler tor, but you can end wherever you want. For example, this graph has an Euler walk. We can go over every edge just once, and we don't end up where we started, but that's totally fine. I won't show why, but you can prove fairly easily that even though an Euler tor needs every node to have an even degree, an Euler walk will exist if and only if every node has an even degree or two nodes have an odd degree. Like here, this node has an even degree, but these two have odd degrees. And since it's exactly two that have odd degrees, the criteria for an Euler walk is met. And now look back at our graph above. Remember, four of these nodes have an odd degree. Therefore, an Euler walk does not exist. This means if you think of the red dot as a pencil, we cannot go over every edge just once without repeating. Therefore, we of course cannot draw the shape without going back over a line. And that means this condition that is basically saying an Euler walk must exist cannot be met. And that's why it's impossible to draw this shape given these two criteria. Then one more quick graph theory example has to do with cycles and trees. This graph right here has a cycle. In fact, it has multiple. There's a way to start somewhere and trace some path where you end at the same place without repeating any nodes or edges. This graph here has no cycles, which means it's called a tree. Here's something you'll prove in class as a computer scientist or mathematician. No matter what connected graph you have or how many cycles it has, like this one above, there's a way to remove certain edges such that you have a tree, but don't lose any nodes. They're all still there and everything is still connected. This is called a spanning tree. So imagine we have this graph where the nodes represent computers and the edges are long cables that connect them. Maybe for some reason there's an issue where this network is too expensive with maintaining all the cables. Maybe you want some way to keep all the computers connected, but have the minimum amount of cables. Well, now you know no matter how chaotic this looks, like it could be every network in the world, there's always a way to remove just the cables while keeping all the computers included and connected such that information can still make it from one to another. And you'll even get into weighted graphs where the edges come with weights, maybe representing how expensive the cables are. And you'll figure out how to find the minimum weight spanning tree such that the weights are the lowest. Hopefully you're seeing how big graph theory is and why it's so crucial. The next topic I'll cover is number three, which I will go over in part two.